Well, greetings, everybody. <clears throat> I better wait till I get this microphone on so you can hear me. So once again, I'll say greetings, everybody. It's uh, been just about 11 years since I've been here, and I'm glad to be back in Melbourne once again. You have a lovely city here. And you also have quite a little larger number here than we had last time I was here. We've been growing, and I hope we've been growing spiritually as well as in numbers. I think I have a very important message for you today. I want to speak on how you and I both came to be here. Jesus Christ started the church a little over 1950 years ago, or just about that, in the year 31 A.D. The church jumped the track of the truth that he had given them about 70, between 53 and 70 A.D. The true gospel of Jesus was suppressed. A false counterfeit was substituted. Instead of preaching the message that Christ brought, they preached about the person of the messenger. You've heard a lot about Christ, and Jesus himself said many would come, saying that he, Jesus, is the Christ, but deceiving the many. And that's been happening now for more than 1,900 years. It's happening all over the world today. I think I saw out front as we were coming some uh, people with some banners talking about uh, a religion of fear. Well, let me tell you, the religion I want to bring you is one of faith and one of hope and one of a coming world peace such as no one dreams of. And one where everyone who ever did live, and everyone who lives together, or lives today, is going to have a great opportunity to come into that world peace and come to have everlasting life. It's just as far from fear as it's possible to get. It's too bad that some people can't know the truth, but this is a very deceived world that we live in. Well, the true church, as I said, jumped the track of God's truth that Christ had given it. Now, Christ gave it that truth through the apostles. Christ talked to many of the people. He preached to thousands while he was here, many thousands. But of all of the many, many thousands to whom he preached, only a hundred uh, and, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yes, only a hundred and, uh, what was it, a hundred and thirty? All of a sudden that skipped my mind. Believe what he said, as you find in Acts, the first chapter in the fifteenth verse. Very few people ever believed him. And that's too bad. People don't believe God. But why do people believe what they do today? Now, the church had to go underground. By 70 A.D., all history of the church had been sabotaged and has been missing ever since. We came to what is known as the lost century, so far as church history is concerned. For about 100 years, there is no historic record of what happened at all. And about 100 years later, about 170, 150 to 70 A.D., we find the church calling itself Christian, but just about as far from the church that Christ had started as you could get. 
It was the Babylonian mystery religion that had come in, come in and taken over. They had taken the name of Christ and called themselves Christian. They had borrowed one thing of Christ that the Babylonian mystery religion had not had, and that was grace for the remission of sin. But they turned grace into license to disobey. They did away with the law of God. They had done away with the message of Christ, the kingdom of God. The true church had gone underground. The true church continued on. But it was persecuted. It was small in numbers. They had to meet often secretly. Sometimes they had to flee. Hundreds and even thousands were martyred. They were persecuted for their belief. They had to flee through the mountains of Europe and even of Asia. We come on down. Now let me tell you how they got the truth. The truth came from Jesus Christ, and Christ got it from God. Jesus said he had spoken nothing of himself. He is the Word. He had said nothing of himself. The Father who sent him, God the Father, had told him what to say and what to speak. Now he called his apostles, and he taught them. And the church got the truth through the apostles. And that's the way the church got the truth. Now, a generation or two later, the apostles weren't there. I wonder if you ever heard of a game, I think they used to call it the whispering game. I don't remember the name of it. I played it many, many, many years ago when I was a young man. You get a group of people, old 15, 18, 20 people, around in a line. And one starts a little sentence of maybe 10, say 10 or 12 words, and he whispers it to the first one. And that one listens, and then he whispers that sentence to the one next to him. And that one whispers the sentence, as he thought he heard it, to the one next to him. And it keeps going on to the end of the line. And by the time you get to the end of the line, the one who heard it says what he thought he heard. And it's as far from the sentence the way it started out as you could get. Now, when you get truth from man to man, and man gets it from other men, it gets distorted as it goes along. You hear a rumor, you get it secondhand, thirdhand, fourthhand, and every time it gets twisted a little bit. Even the true church had gotten its message that way. Now, there were no Bibles at all extant. There was no printing. That came about four or five hundred years ago. And even after printing came, a Bible was so rare they had to have a chained Bible so that people could come one at a time and look at it and pass on, but they couldn't take it with them. There weren't enough copies. Well, they did have Bibles for a while, but they were all handwritten. But even after printing, it was some time before there were enough Bibles. It's only in the last 100, 150, 200 years that enough Bibles have been printed so most people can have it. Today, the Bible is the world's number one seller. There are more Bibles in more homes and more other places where a Bible might be than any other book today. And yet the Bible is probably one of the least read. It certainly is the least understood. It is the most distorted, maligned, twisted, perverted of any book that has ever been written. And people simply do not understand it. Now, where did the Apostle Paul get his truth? The Apostle Paul had been trying to persecute the church, even to the extent of having them killed and martyred. He was assenting to the stoning and the martyrdom of the first martyr, Stephen. He was at least agreeing with it. But Jesus Christ 
who had ascended to heaven, had been given all power in heaven and in earth. And Jesus Christ is the head of the church, although he's in heaven. And Jesus Christ struck the apostle Paul down with blindness. He fell down. He was on a walk toward Damascus. He knew immediately that something had happened to him. And Christ spoke to him and others with him and told him to take him, although he was now blind, into Damascus, where a man was going to show him what to do. And that woke him up, and he realized that everything he had been believing was just the opposite of the truth. Paul later stated in some of his writings in the New Testament that he had been with Christ, that he had seen Christ actually. He also mentioned that he had been over in uh, Arabia for three years. And that is the place where Christ in person saw him, taught him what he had. Everything that he had believed before was erased from his mind. And he started all out new and afresh with the truth of God. And when he came back from Arabia, he went over to Jerusalem to compare with the apostles who had been taught by Christ when he was here in physical person before his crucifixion, to see if they were speaking the same thing. Because Paul had been instructed by Christ, we must all speak the same thing. And that same thing must come from God, through Christ, through an apostle, to us. That's the way they got it. That's the way we have to get it today. And when Paul came to Jerusalem, he talked to Peter and others there and found he had been told the same thing by the same Christ that they had been told. And they had absolute harmony and agreement. He wanted to be sure that they all had the same truth direct from Christ. All right, since then, Christ in person has not spoken to any man. The next generation got the truth from those that had gotten it from the apostles. The second generation and the third generation got it from the generations just before them. And like the whispering game, they got a little less of it. And they got it a little bit twisted. And so the truth and the doctrines in the church became, even in the true church now I'm talking about, became twisted and mixed up a little bit, and they began to lose a lot of the original truth. Now, it's hard to believe that, but that is what actually happened, my brethren. In the meantime, of course, the big church was going on, ruling over governments, and was part of the governments of this world. Now, nearly all persecution has always come from government, and today it's coming from the media, the public media, the press, radio, and television, as well as from government. You can search all you want, and that's where you'll find the persecution is coming from. It was the government that persecuted Christ. You say the Pharisees persecuted him, yes, but they were in the government. They had lowly uh, positions in the government of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was letting them do all the minor work of ruling the government so that they didn't have to have too many administrators over in uh, the land of Palestine. Now that is the way it came on down. I can get that light just right. I don't see much of you out there. I, I just see the light up here. And I vaguely see you out there. I know you're there, but I couldn't see a single individual of you to recognize you. However, I'll go on speaking to you just the same. All right. Now then, I came among... Uh, God first opened my mind to look into the Bible and to study it in the fall of 1926 when I was challenged both on the doctrine of evolution, which is taught in the colleges and universities of this world, 
and which is the uh, uh, the eyeglasses, you might say, through which they see all truth today. Now, the truth they know today is all mechanic, mechanical, physical, materialistic. They have no spiritual truth whatsoever. The natural human mind cannot receive spiritual truth unless it is revealed, and it can be revealed only by the Holy Spirit of God. And very few have ever had the Holy Spirit of God, or very few have it today. But when I came among them, I, I came to see the truth in the Bible. And I want to tell you a little of my experience. Now, Jesus Christ was the Word of God in person. The Bible is the Word of God in writing, in print. It's the same Word of God. The Bible is the same Word of God in the same words that taught Peter, the original apostles, and then taught the apostle Paul. But after that, other people got it from the people that they had taught. And the next generation got it from the second generation. The third gener uh, the fourth generation got it from the third generation until they lost a lot of the original truth. Now, I had been brought up in a Protestant church, and when I first began to be challenged on the law of God and the Sabbath of God, as well as on the doctrine of evolution, at first, I came to wonder if there was a God. I had to prove whether God exists. But to my mind, it was proved. I found absolute proof that God does exist. The next thing is the Bible, the medium by which God reveals himself to us and speaks to us. Now, I have been in business for a number of years, and I knew, of course, that every manufacturer who has a product to a uh, commodity that he sells, sends along with his product a uh, little instruction book or an instruction manual to show you what the product is, how it operates, and how to operate it, what its purpose is, how to make it perform its purpose. All right, the greatest product ever created or put together is the human being. And God is the manufacturer of the human being. And God sent along an instruction manual. And the Bible is that instruction manual. He tells us what we are, why we are, what we're here for, how we should live, and why, and where we're going, and how to get there. Most people don't know anything about that because they have never understood the Bible. The Bible is written in a word that it is mysterious to the world. Now, the Bible is concerned with two things primarily. Of course, it has materialistic, physical knowledge. It's speaking to a material people made of the dust of the ground, and therefore it speaks to them in a language that they could be, should be able to understand, the only language they can understand, as a matter of fact. Now. Human beings have accomplished a great many things in this 20th century. We've flown to the moon and back. We've sent uh, unmanned spacecraft to send back photographs right on the very close-up surface of Mars. We have close-up photographs sent back to the Earth from Saturn and Jupiter. We've manufactured some marvelous mechanisms like the computer, the modern automobile, motion pictures, television, many, many things that have come, not most of them in my lifetime, because we didn't have any motion pictures, we didn't have any uh, television or radio, in fact, we didn't even have automobiles when I was a little boy. When I was 11 years old, no one had ever flown in the air yet, no human being ever had. But while I was 11, during my, uh, I was in the 12th year when I was 11, uh, and it was during that year that one of the Wright brothers flew about as far from one, as from one end of this auditorium to the other. 
That was the first flight a human being had ever taken. That's the first flight, and I was 11 years old. Now, we've accomplished many things in a materialistic way, but we have also found our troubles have escalated, and the world is full of troubles and evils and of suffering of every kind. And all of our problems that we can't solve, all of our troubles and evils are spiritual in nature. All of our accomplishments are physical and materialistic in nature. But the human mind is so constructed with, with that without the Holy Spirit of God, it cannot understand, it cannot conceive spiritual truth or spiritual knowledge. Now, the Bible is concerned with physical knowledge, but also with spiritual knowledge, and primarily with spiritual knowledge and spiritual truth, and the natural mind cannot understand that part of the Bible, and that's the main part of the Bible. So they don't understand the Bible. They just don't understand it. I began to see things in the Bible. First, I read in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. I said, well, that's not true. I've always been taught the wages of sin is eternal life in hell fire. Then I saw the next part, the last half of the same sentence, the gift of God is eternal life. Well, I said, why should we have to have eternal life as a gift when we're already immortal souls? And then I began to see that the Bible said, the soul that sins, it shall die. I began to learn where Jesus said that no man has ever gone to heaven, and where the Bible teaches that no man ever will. The earth has God given to the sons of men, and we shall inherit the earth forever, not heaven. I began to see that what I had been taught was absolutely wrong. God did something to me that he did for the Apostle Paul way back there 1950 years ago. He just erased everything I had ever believed from my mind, and I started from scratch all over. Brethren, I know of no other religious leader in the world in these last 1950 years even. Today or it was 100 years ago or a 1,000 years ago, whoever came to his knowledge directly from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave the truth to the church through the apostles. The church got it from the apostles. Other people, the next generation got it from the apostles. The second generation got it from that generation, the third from the second generation, and finally they lost a lot of it. Now, the true church still existed, and I came among them in 1927. They're called the Sardis Church in the, second, the third chapter of the book of Revelation, the Sardis era of the church. I found they had lost so much of the knowledge that God was opening to me in the Bible. Christ was speaking to me. This is the Word of God, the same as Jesus Christ in person is the personal Word of God. I was being taught by the same one. I find that other leaders didn't get their knowledge out of this book, the Bible. They got it from other people. Now, just two or three days ago, the Pope of Rome, the head of the Catholic Church, the biggest uh, church on earth, and the largest uh, in Christianity, he was shot in an assassination attempt. All right, where did the Pope, looked on by many millions of people as the greatest religious leader on earth, where did he get all that he knows about religion? Where did he get his knowledge of what he believes is the truth of God, the doctrines that he teaches his people? He got it from other men. He didn't get it direct from Christ. He didn't get it direct from this book. He was taught from a child on. Where did Charles and John Wesley get their knowledge? They started the Methodist Church. They got it from other people. They got an idea or two of their own that they added and made it a little different religion than the others, and they started the Methodist Church. Another man started the Baptist Church the same way. 
They all got their religion from other people. Where do ministers get their religion today? They go to a seminary of their particular denomination or their kind of religion. And there they're taught by other men. And I tell you, if you go and examine the seminaries, they're not taught by this word, the Bible. The time had come at the end for God to raise up someone to raise up the temple that Christ is coming to, and that is a spiritual temple which is the church, and to restore the truth that had been lost for 1950 years. Well, it was about 1900 years at that time, because this was about 54 years ago. But just as it was in the days of the Apostle Paul, let me read you what Paul said, the same thing happened to me. He says here in Galatians 1, verse 15, But when it pleased God, who separated, separated me from my mother's womb and called me uh, by, his na by his grace to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. He didn't go to a seminary. He didn't go to other men. He did not get the truth that he began to proclaim from other people. Neither went I to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. Now, I say the same thing. Neither did I when God began to open my mind, go to other people. I did not go to a religious seminary. I went to this Bible. I began to find that everything I'd been taught was wrong, and I threw it all out. I began from scratch. Other people don't do that. They take what they have, and they may change one or two ideas. They may grab one or two new truths. Most people won't even do that. Instead of that, they lose one or two truths they already had. It was a different experience, and that's how you came to be here today and how I came to be here today. I want you to realize that, that God reveals his truth through Christ, and Christ reveals it through those whom he calls to be apostles. Now, it had gone down, and they had lost. I found that the Sardis Church still had the truth about the Sabbath day and the law of God to an extent. They didn't have all of the truth even about the law of God. They still had the true name, Church of God. That's all they had. They knew that uh, uh, we don't go to a burning hell if we're wicked. They knew we don't go to heaven. They knew that Christ would come and there would be a thousand-year reign on earth, but they had no idea what that thousand-year reign would be like. They didn't realize the truth about the kingdom of God and what it will be like. We have a whole book on the world tomorrow, what it will be like. They didn't know any of those things. God revealed all of that to me. God revealed to me about the annual Sabbath. When I went to them and taught the Sardis people about that, they laughed me to scorn. God revealed to me the truth of who we are, that we're the lost tribes of Israel, of the birthright tribes of, and, uh, of Ephraim and of Manasseh. When I went to them about that, they refused to accept a bit of it. Although their leader said he knew God had revealed that to me and it was true and God would use it someday. But he couldn't accept it because of political reasons he couldn't accept it for his position in his church. And so that church never accepted it. But God raised up this church through me and this church has accepted those truths. We have gotten rid of the errors, and swept it clean, and come to the truth of God. And that has not been done in 1950 years on the face of this earth. I just wanted you to know that.
Now then, I want to give you some truths that have been hidden from this world for about 1950 years, and it is to them a mystery. It's so mysterious they just don't understand it. In a world, there's a gigantic missing dimension in knowledge. The knowledge they teach in schools and in colleges and universities is altogether materialistic knowledge. It is knowledge just for this present mechanical, materialistic existence that we have, which is not life. But I'm coming to that. Let's go on. Man today does not have life. Man only has a temporary physical, physiochemical existence. We're made from the dust of the ground. We get our life through the blood circulating in our veins to there, and we have to constantly refuel by eating food and drinking water, usually about three times a day. In other words, we have a temporary existence. It is not life. Now, that's the first point I want you to get. We do not have, as we are born, we do not have life. We have a temporary existence. And it comes out of the ground. And we're like an alarm clock wound up that is constantly running down. And when it runs down, it stops. It's dead. In other words, human beings have a temporary existence. They are running down toward death. They are dying gradually every day they live. And every human being is one breath away from absolute death, the cessation of life. I know I've gone through it almost four years ago. My breath stopped. My face was all blanched a different color. I wasn't, I, I don't remember because I wasn't, I wasn't conscious. I believe it was blanched white, whatever it was. They brought me back by mouth to mouth resuscitation. But for some little, for a great many seconds, I was not breathing. There was no circulation of blood. My heart was not beating. I was as dead as you can be. But they brought me back. I've gone through that experience. I don't fear death any longer. I just don't. But I hope God will keep me alive for a little longer because I believe it is needful for you. Man does not have real life. I can't even read my own writing here. No, he doesn't know how to obtain it. He doesn't have real life, and he doesn't know how to obtain it. All life has to come from God. Life is one of the, the well, the very first law of biochemistry, which is a scientific law, is that life comes only from life. Life can't come from dead matter or from the not living. It only comes from other life. God has life inherent in himself, self-containing life, and he has life to impart and to give. Now, it's important that we understand how all life comes, and everything begins with God, and the world doesn't know anything about God. Do you know that of all of the religions in the world, not only Christianity, but you can take uh, Taoism, Shintoism, Mohammedanism, uh, uh, all, all of the religions in the world, and you know not one of them knows who and what God is. They do not know who and what God is. All right, let's go a little further. They don't know what man is or why he is. They don't know why man was ever put on the earth or how he came to be here. 
They don't know whether he was put here for a reason, for a purpose. They don't know what, what lies ahead, where we're going, or if we are going anywhere. They just don't know. The religions don't know. Science doesn't know. And education doesn't know and doesn't impart that knowledge. You don't get that in the colleges or the universities because they don't know. Now, if we want to know about God and about the very start of life, we don't start with Genesis 1-1. We start in the New Testament with John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was a divine, supernatural, spirit-composed personage. A Word that had life, was immortally alive, with inherent, self-containing life. Not a temporary existence, but immortal life. The Word was a personage. That Word was with another personage called God. And there you have two personages together, but the Word also is God. So both of them were God, but one is just called God and the other was called the Word originally. Now, the next verse, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, that is, by the Word. Without him was not anything made that was made. In Ephesians 3, 9, Oh, no, wait, before I go to that, the twelfth verse, the twelfth verse, the Word, uh, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who originally had always existed. And he had existed as God, and he was with God. But his name originally was the Word, which means he was the divine spokesman. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Now, in Ephesians 3, 9, we read that God created all things by Jesus Christ. God is the maker. God told Christ what to do. Christ is the word. He spake, as one of the Psalms says. The Holy Spirit emanating from God and from Christ is the power that actually did what Christ said to do. And that is the way creation came about. That is the way you and I were formed, made out of dust of the ground, and got our temporary existence that we have. Now then, let's go a little farther. And remember that God had life inherent, and this Word had life. They were composed of spirit, not of matter. And they're, they're, they are creators. And the first thing that they created was angels. There was no matter. There was no universe. There was nothing physical. There was no matter, but they created angels first. Now, let's go a little farther. I want you to notice in Genesis 1-1 now, the first chapter of Genesis and verse 1, the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that should be the plural, as Moses wrote in the Hebrew language, his word is plural, heavens. He created the heavens, that's the entire universe, and the earth. Now, the word here says God. That's an English word. Moses wrote in the Hebrew language, and the word Moses wrote was Elohim in the Hebrew language, and Elohim means, it is a uniplural word, meaning more than one person forming one God. It's a word like family, like group. There can be a number of people and uh, forming a group, but it's still one group. You can have two people. You can have five people in a family, more than one person, but it's only one family. The Jones family, the Smith family, the Anderson family. One family. 
but more than one person. There is one God, and only one God, but that one God is composed of more than one personage. And the Word is one of those personages from all eternity, and the other called God is a personage. Now, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary and was made flesh. He, the Word, now came as a human being. He gave up all of his divine great powers and came to be a mortal human being, but he still was God as well as man. He was God with us. And then God the Father became his Father after Jesus was born as a human being, begotten of God, and born of the Virgin Mary. Now, God created the whole universe. He created matter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Turn to the second chapter of Genesis and verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens, plural, and of the earth. See, the heavens and the earth, when they, both the heavens and the earth, that's the whole universe, including the earth, were created. In the day that the eternal God made the earth and the heavens. In the same day, he made the earth and the heavens. Now, that may have been billions of years ago. We don't know how far back that was. But there's one thing we do know that the Bible does reveal, and most people have never found it, because you don't get all the Bible in one place. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, a little of it. You, you have many pieces, and you have to put all the pieces together. So one of the pieces is here, another piece is over in the book of Job, in the 38th chapter, and uh, beginning with verse 1. Let me read you a little of that in, in Job, the 38th chapter, where Job had just created a, the greatest building on earth, the Great Pyramid. Job was the, the master craftsman that hired all of the men and supervised the building of the Great Pyramid. He did it for a pharaoh of Egypt. He was not a pharaoh. He was not an Egyptian at all. But he was a, a very great man. And uh, uh, he was a very self-righteous man. And finally God was speaking to him and sort of whittling him down to size because he was, was very self-righteous. And then the Lord... Job chapter 38, verse 1. The Lord uh, answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, verse 4, to Job, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job had laid the foundations of the greatest building on earth, but God had laid the... Jesus had laid the foundations of the entire earth, the one who became the God of the Old Testament. In the Hebrew, it was called Yahweh. It's here called the Lord. Where were you and I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof of the earth fastened? Or, when... Uh, uh, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now, the only building on earth where the cornerstone is the top capstone, the last stone to be laid, is the Great Pyramid. And actually, that top capstone never was laid. It isn't there. But on the earth it was laid, but not on the Great Pyramid. Where were you when I laid uh, the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars, or angels sang together, and all the sons of God, and the only sons of God at that time were the angels, because he created them, and all the angels shouted for joy. So the angels had already been created before the earth. The earth was created at the same time as the rest of the universe, and all of the galaxies, the entire universe, and... There they were at the earth and shouting for joy. Why? Because the earth was to become their abode and they were to be put here and to live here on the earth. 
And it was very beautiful as God originally created it. But now they did something to it, and it, uh, they marred it so it was not beautiful any longer. <clears throat> All right, God now was going to develop character into the angels, and he put them here to improve the earth and to even uh, uh, make it more beautiful. In the earth, of course, was matter, and some of that matter contains energy. There's a lot of energy in the material earth. And uh, they were to do things with the earth to improve it and really to, to finish it, although it was beautiful as God turned it over to them. But God put the angels on earth and in order to supervise their life together, one with another. God set over them his government. Now, God has life. God lives. The next question is, how does God live? He lives the way of outflowing love. There are different ways you can live, and primarily there are just two different philosophies or ways of life, and I call one the way of give, outflowing love. The other is incoming lust and incoming greed and, and uh, uh, coveting, and I call that get, so that even a little child can understand it. God's way is outflowing love. Now, he has a law, and that law is love. There are two divisions of God's law, and that is love to God is the first part of it, in worship and in obedience, and also love to your fellow creatures by outflowing love toward them, cooperation, helping, serving, sharing with them all together. Now, the opposite way, then, is rebellion against God and fighting against your neighbor, trying to take away from him and get from him, get everything for yourself, trying to have all you can get. The way of competition, the way of strife, the way of what we have on this earth, so much of today, violence and destruction. God set a throne on this earth, and he set a super archangel on that throne to govern the angels. That archangel's name was Lucifer. He was a super archangel of a higher uh, uh, grade of creation than the ordinary angels. He had been on the very throne of God. His wings had covered over the very throne of God in heaven. He had been instructed by God, and he knew the way of God, the way of law. Now, every government is based on a foundation, a constitution, or a basic law. Now, what do you have in Australia? I don't know. In the United States, we have a constitution. And all laws have to be based on that constitution. It's the basic law. Other laws are based on it. The law of God is outflowing love. Love to God, love to your fellow beings. And then you can define it, and in, 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 in the case of men, it finally was codified in the Ten Commandments. The first four tell you how to love God, the last six how to love your neighbor. And that is the law of God. All right, now, in the 14th chapter of Isaiah, you'll find about this Lucifer, how he was put on earth. And his name was Lucifer. And uh, let's see, Isaiah 14. Oh, wait, I don't think I have it. No, I've got it wrong. Here I have it. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. So he was below heaven. He was on the earth. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He had a throne. There was a throne on earth, and he was sitting on it to rule the whole earth. 
with the government of God. And the government of God was founded on a constitution, which is the law of God, the way of give, the way of outflowing love. I will exalt my throne above the stars or angels of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, where God's throne is, in the far, far north. That's the only thing we have in the Bible that tells us anything about where God's throne is, God's heaven. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, so he was below clouds, he was on earth. I will be like the Most High, or he was going to become the Most High. Now you read more about him in Ezekiel 28, and beginning with uh, uh, with verse uh, 14, where it says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Uh, and in verse 15, Thou wast perfect in thy ways, all thy ways, from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. God created him, and he was perfect in the way he lived, until he turned away from the way of God and rebelled, and rebellion seized him. Jealousy, envy against God, competition, strife. And he wanted to war against God, and he turned his angels into an army, and they swooped up to heaven to knock God off the throne. He wanted to rule. Wanted to rule the entire universe. He wasn't satisfied with this one little earth down here. He wanted everything. <coughs> we have too many men like that today. Now, he was perfect from the day he was created. He was not a born human being. He was a created archangel, and iniquity was found in him. His heart was lifted up because of his beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness, and he became perverted in mind and everything. Lucifer then became Satan the devil, and his angels all became demons. And as a result of their violence and their wrong way, physical destruction and decay came to this earth. Instead of beautifying the earth, they made it ugly. And it came to a very uh, decayed state. Now his angels sinned along with him. In Second Peter 2 and verse 4, you read, If God spared not the angels that sinned. So God didn't spare them either. The angels all sinned and followed Lucifer. Now, there came to be darkness and decay on the face of the earth. Now, we'll go back to Genesis 1 again, in the first chapter of Genesis, and in verse uh, 2, the earth was, or became, and that same word is translated became elsewhere, uh, became without form and void. The Hebrew words Moses wrote were tohu and bohu, and a better translation than without form and void would be chaotic and in confusion, waste and empty, or uh, uh, desolate and uh, decayed. And that is not the original created state at all. That is the way it became after the angels had been here, and they may have been here millions of years. We don't know. We don't know how long they were here before they went the wrong way. Now, the earth then came into a very devastated state and condition, and very ugly. Now, in the uh, 104th Psalm, and verse 31, Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. Psalms 104, verse 30. God sends forth his spirit, and he renews the face of the earth. And the spirit goes forth, and he does his creating. Now go back to Genesis 2. 
the earth had become in this uh, chaotic condition, and uh, uh, darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was all ocean surface, no land. All was ocean, and it was chaotic. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. Now he sent forth his Spirit. Then the Word speaks. And God said, that was the Word who did the saying, Let there be light. The Holy Spirit came forth, and there was light. Now in six days God renewed the face of the earth for man. Now God was going to create man out of matter. He had created angels. He sent his government over them. They... One third of them had turned wrong and followed Satan. Now God was going to do the most, the greatest feat of creation possible. God was going to reproduce Himself. He was going to take dirt, matter, right out of matter, the Ontario earth. He was going to form and shape it into a, a man in the same form and shape as God. And out of that man, ultimately, he was going to have man reproduce, and out of all of the millions of men that would be re reproduced, he was going to ultimately convert millions of them into God beings just like God himself. No religion on earth understands this. No religion understands it, whatever. In six days God remade the first surface of the earth for man. In verse 26 of Genesis 1, God said, Let us, not me, you say it's Elohim, more than one person forming God, God and the Word, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Animals were made after their own kind, cattle after the cattle kind, dogs after the dog kind. But now we are making man after the God kind, altogether different. But how did he form man? Now, God was made of spirit, but not man. In the seventh verse of the second chapter of Genesis, Genesis 2, verse 7, the uh, eternal God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man, what he formed out of the ground, became a living soul. So a soul came out of the ground. A soul is not an immortal soul. A soul is mortal and comes out of the ground. That's what God says. The devil said, oh no, you, you won't surely die. You, you're an immortal soul. The churches today all believe that. They believe the devil. They don't believe God. But God made man, made the soul out of the dust of the earth. Now, the eternal God planted a garden eastward in Eden in the very next verse here. And there he put the man that he had formed, and out of the ground made the eternal God to grow every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two special trees. There are a lot of other trees, but these two are very special, and they're symbolic. The tree of life. That symbolized the Spirit of God. If Adam had taken of that, he could have taken immortal life. Now remember, Adam was only created out of the dust of the ground with a physiochemical, temporary existence. A physical, uh, physiochemical existence out of the dust of the ground. Now let's drop down to verse 15. The eternal God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the eternal God commanded the man, saying, "Of every tree in the, uh, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For if you eat of it, you shall surely die." Now he gave him freely the tree of life. All he had to do was reach out and take it, and he would have had immortal life. But God was not going to let him do that unless he denied and made a choice between that and the other tree. Now, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil simply represented the way Satan had been living. Satan did not agree with God's way of living. God's way of living is outflowing love. The tree of life would have given him the love of God shed abroad in his heart, 
to love to fulfill that law. The tree of life would have given him the Holy Spirit that would have opened his mind to spiritual knowledge. So we would know how to live spiritually. The tree of life would have imparted divine life to him. But he made man, man and woman, male and female, created he then. He told them to reproduce and replenish the earth. It had been plenished before with angels. He said, and replenish the earth. Now, let me tell you a little something right here. Do you know how you came into being? Every one of you originally started with an ovum in your mother's ovary, in one of the ovaries of your mother. And that ovum had only a temporary physical existence, just a short existence of not more than 28 days. It could not have existed longer than 28 days. And every time an ovum came into your, uh, left your mother's uh, uh, ovary, by the time it went through the fallopian tube and got into your mother's uh, uterus or womb, it died there, unless it had been fertilized by a male sperm cell. And God made it so that the male and the female worked together. And the male sperm cell coming from the very body of the male, a sperm cell is only one-fiftieth of the size of an ovum. An ovum is only the size of a pinpoint, the same as a period at the end of a sentence of ordinary small type in a newspaper. And the sperm cell coming from the human father to give it physical human existence and reproduction is only one-fiftieth as large, but it imparts life. And if that life is imparted within that 28 days, then that ovum becomes an embryo. And that's what you became and what I became, every one of us, in our mother's womb. And for four months we were an embryo. And at the end of four months we became a fetus. And we had begun to take on human form and shape in our mother's womb. A head began to appear. Arms and legs began to appear. A heart began to form and lungs and other organs in the body. And they began to to develop over the next five months until you had come ready to be born. And you came out into the world and you were born. And you gave us a, a cry of blast, blast when you were first born. Because that first breath hurt your lungs. And also with that first breath came a spirit into you that imparted the power of intellect to the physical brain that had been born and had grown within your mother. Now then, during that nine months that you were first an embryo and then a fetus, you had to be fed on physical food to grow large enough to be born. And that came through your mother. We today are in the church, and the church is Jerusalem above the mother of us all, your Bible says. So the church is the mother of us all. And the duty of the church is to feed and nourish the brethren in the church on spiritual food, we have to go spiritually. I'm going to come to more of that if I don't forget it later. I want to explain that. But, you see, there is physical reproduction. Now, God is reproducing himself, and that is spiritual reproduction. God made us, listen, that ovum in your mother's uh coming out of your mother's uh, ovary, it had a nucleus in it. Each of us is uh, an ovum, and each of us has a nucleus, and that's the physical brain. But there is a spirit in that physical brain. And that physical, uh, that, that spirit in man, I call it a human spirit because it's in man and is not in animals imparts the power of intellect that animals, brute animals, don't have. We call them dumb animals. But 
but it only empowers you to think and reason about physical material things because it acts as a computer and uh, it stores up the knowledge you have and it gives you instant recall of all of the knowledge that you have. But how do you obtain knowledge? You obtain knowledge through the eye, things you see, through the ear. Now, the spirit doesn't hear, doesn't see. The spirit in you doesn't hear. The brain hears through the ear. The brain sees through the eye. The brain smells through the nose. And you only get knowledge then through what you see or hear or smell or taste or feel by the sense of touch. And you can't get any other kind of knowledge in your mind normally and naturally. You just can't. And you can't see it, spirit, and you can't hear spirit, you can't taste it, smell it, or feel it. So you can't get spiritual knowledge in your mind, and it can't come unless you have God's spirit. Now, the coming of God's Spirit is the coming of the sperm cell from the very body of God into you. And that comes in with the Spirit in your brain and enlightens your brain now to understand spiritual knowledge. No wonder the people in the world don't understand spiritual knowledge. You know that the most highly educated people in the world with the greatest Degrees of letters after their names are the most ignorant because they don't have any spiritual knowledge. They've been educated in a lot of materialistic knowledge. They don't have any knowledge of spiritual things, and all of our problems and troubles and evils are spiritual in nature, and so they can't solve them. The greatest minds can't solve our problems in this world. That's where our troubles come from. Now, God is reproducing himself, and the way he reproduces is the Holy Spirit is the sperm cell from God that imparts immortal God life into us. And that was offered to Adam. But Adam first had to decide he would live that life in the way of God, of outflowing love, to help him be happy, outflowing love toward others that would help him make his neighbors happy. His neighbors could only have it too if they would have that spirit of love which would make him happy and make them happy. And we would all help one another. We would have peace. We would have cooperation. We would help our neighbors to produce more. They would help us to produce more. We would share and we would all have much more. Oh, how much more we could have if we lived that way. And we would have a utopia. And we would have peace. But no man has got to fight his neighbor. Man has to live the other way. That's the way Satan shows. Now, Adam let his wife Eve lead him to take to himself of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That meant he decided for himself the way of life. The Holy Spirit would have showed him God's way of life, would have opened his mind to understand the spiritual knowledge of God's way of life. Adam rejected that and instead took to himself the ideas of whatever knowledge he could produce in himself of how he thought he ought to live. And there was Satan there to lead him in the way of competition the way of strife, the way of hostility, the way of vanity, the way of glorifying the self, the way of selfishness and of lust and of greed, of vanity, of envy and jealousy toward others. And that's the way humanity has been living ever since. That's where our problems are. That's where our troubles are. Now then, God intended that man should take of the tree of life. It was freely offered to Adam, but he had to reject the way of Satan. He could have restored the government of God to earth, and Adam could have sat on that throne of the whole earth and ruled it over his own children. But instead, he, let, he went the way of Satan. Now then, what happened? 
In Genesis 3 and verse 22, after Adam made that decision, the eternal God said, Now, lest Adam put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and live forever, if he did that, he would live forever in the way that was making him unhappy, the way that would make him miserable, the way that would bring sorrow, that would bring suffering and pain and anguish on him and on his neighbor. And his neighbor would live that way and bring pain and suffering on themselves and on Adam. And every man would harm and make every other man unhappy. And lest he do that and live forever in that kind of misery and unhappiness, therefore the eternal God put him forth from the Garden of Eden, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword pointing every way to keep the way of the tree of life. God shut up the tree of life. God shut the Holy Spirit off from mankind. Now, Adam sinned, and that cut him off from God. Adam's son Cain sinned and killed his brother Abel, and then he lied to God about it. And he brought on himself the penalty of death. And God had shut, and, and shut himself off from the Spirit of God. And he shut himself off from God. God didn't shut himself off from man, but man shut himself off from God. But God shut up the Holy Spirit and the giving of life to man. And all man that have now was a temporary physical chemical existence until the second Adam could come. That's until Jesus Christ could come. Now right here is where Christianity jumps the track. Life, the Holy Spirit, was shut up until the second Adam could come and pay the penalty of man's sin, and he said, and reconcile man to God, wipe the slate clean so that man could receive the Spirit of God when man would start to live the right way to have, the, to have eternal life in happiness and in peace. And the churches don't know that. The churches of this world don't know it. The religions of this world don't know it. Humanity doesn't know it. Our educators don't know it. And your colleges and universities, the scientists don't know it. Your captains of industry, your bankers and your industrialists don't know it. They only know material, physical things and business, manufacturing out of material goods and things like that. That's all they know. So here's where they jump the track until the time of the second Adam. All right, now then we want to turn over to Hebrews, the ninth chapter and verse 27. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. And as it is appointed unto a man once to die, God said to Adam, if you take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. He did. He was like an alarm clock running down. He ran down after 930 years and he died. He only lived 930 years and he never got life in all that time. So it says, it is appointed to man once to die, but after this the judgment by a resurrection. Now other scriptures point that out and tell us that all who died in Adam are going to be resurrected in Christ and are going to come to a judgment when, after Christ has paid for our sins, they will have a chance to give account for what they've done, and if they repent, they will be given a time to prove their repentance and that they want to live God's way by a certain amount of time, whatever God will give them. In mortal life, and if they do, they will have the Holy Spirit and be given immortal life. That's the kind of a religion of fear that we believe in. I wish that some poor simple ones like people with signs out front could understand some of the truths of God. Too bad. Now, judgment was on Adam, but he made the wrong choice. When judgment comes on people, they have to make a choice. 
and they have to determine which way they're going to go. Adam, life was offered to Adam, but he made the wrong decision. And eternal life was withdrawn until the second Adam, Christ. So we read in 1 Corinthians 15 now, 1 Corinthians 15, and... Uh, Verse 22, if I can find it here. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22. As in Adam, all die. We all die. We have this temporary physical existence. And we all die in Adam. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive in a resurrection to judgment. It's appointed to man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And that will come by resurrection through Christ. Through Christ. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, he rose from the dead 1950-some years ago. Afterward, they that are Christ that is coming. That's only the church. Only the few that are going to be resurrected to immortal life at Christ's coming. Now, I'm coming to more about that in just a minute. I have to cover these things one at a time to show you what God's whole program and plan is in a way that I think you've never heard it put this way before. <clears throat> Adam and universal sin cut humans off from... Well, God cut us off from the Holy Spirit or from life until the judgment. But through Christ, judgment has been opened first to the church of God. And judgment is on us, and we are given an opportunity to repent and accept the sacrifice of Christ, have our sins forgiven, and now the Holy Spirit is open to us. 1 Peter 4 and verse uh, 17. 1 Peter 4 and verse 17. But the time is come when judgment must begin at the house of God, or the church of God. That is the house of God. And we are the first. We are the first fruits and the first to have salvation. The world as a whole does not have it yet. Now, understand this. Through Adam, try to understand this, brethren. Through Adam, the world was cut off from the Holy Spirit. But through Christ, judgment and access to the Holy Spirit was opened up to the church, and not to any but the church. Now, I want to show you something, a prophecy back in the book of Joel. Joel 2, and in verse uh, 28 where Joel, an Old Testament prophet, made this prophecy. It shall come to pass afterward, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. God shut up the Holy Spirit after Adam's sin, but the time would come when he would pour out his Spirit on all flesh. Now, first judgment starts on the church after Christ, and it only started at the time of Christ and only on the church. Now, there's something more there I've got to come to right away. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, on the, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts 2 and verse 15, uh, Jesus, Peter was giving a sermon, and he said, This, the Holy Spirit, which they saw coming as flames of fire sitting on the head of each of them, they heard the sound like a rushing mighty wind. And they were quite exciting as the Holy Spirit came that day. The first time the Holy Spirit had been opened up since Adam. And he said, this was that prophesied by the prophet Joel, and he quoted the scripture of the prophecy I just read. That the days would come when Christ, when God would open, he would pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. Now then, that was only the start, just to the church only. Physical 
existence now began with Adam. Well, wait a minute. Before I come to that, I want to mention this, that God called the church of the Old Testament, but the Holy Spirit had not been poured out yet, and they did not have life. They did not have the Holy Spirit. They had the knowledge of God, they had the law of God, but that was spiritual, but they were carnal, and they never did comprehend it, and they never did obey it spiritually. They just never did, and they had no life. They are to be resurrected. They died, and after this the resurrection, and judgment will come to them in the great white throne judgment, and we celebrate that on the last day after the great Feast of Tabernacles, on the last great day. Now, physical existence began with Adam, but life, or eternal life, began with Christ. Um, Israel was a type, or a duality, and was given the seven annual festivals to picture this whole life. Now, the Passover, for instance, pictured the sacrifice of Christ to pay the penalty of our sins. What was that? Are you hearing me all right? I, I thought something had happened to the microphone here or something. Uh, anyway, um, I have to catch my place where I was here for a minute. Um, the Passover pictures the crucified Christ so that our sins can be paid in our stead, making it possible, if we do repent and if we believe, that we can now receive the Spirit of God. Now, the second annual festival of the seven days of unleavened bread, which we had a little over two weeks ago, and uh, that picture is putting sin out of our lives. That picture is the fact that we must begin to grow spiritually. And we must be fed on spiritual knowledge. Now we have a spirit life, and that must begin to grow in us. And uh, then uh, the third festival is uh, the uh, the time of uh, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit. We can't put sin out of our lives alone by ourselves. We have to have the help of God and the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, we are the first fruits. The day of Pentecost is merely, as it's called originally in the Old Testament, the feast of first fruits. And we are the first fruits, showing that God has called the church and the church only first, not the whole world. Now, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draws him. Now get that. The world cannot have salvation now. It has not been opened up. It's only those that were predestinated to be called now. Others will be called. Everyone who ever lived is going to have a chance. Everyone is going to be called. Everyone can find eternal life, whoever lives. I don't know whether Adam had his whole judgment then or whether he'll have a chance in the millennium or in the great white throne judgment. I don't know. But nevertheless, everyone will have had a chance. And either Adam did have or he will have. The fourth annual festival is the first day of the seventh month, the Feast of Trumpets. That pictures the second coming of Christ. Then the church will then be born as he was, by a resurrection at Christ's coming, and we will be God beings the same as Christ is, and we will then rule the world when he will begin to convert all that are still alive in this mortal life on earth. And that will range for a thousand years, and they'll be having children, and population will grow during that thousand years. At the end of a thousand years, well, uh, and that's pictured by the fifth, the, the, the millennium, the Feast of Tabernacles, pictures that thousand years uh, rule and reign with Christ. Satan will be put, well, I skipped one. The fifth is the day of 
atonement. That means the putting of Satan away so that Christ and the kingdom of God can rule a thousand years. And uh, the, the, that's the fifth of the festivals. The sixth is the Feast of Tabernacles, or the thousand years reign with Christ on earth, the kingdom of God ruling. And the seventh is the day of judgment at the end of a thousand years, when all who ever lived are going to be resurrected and they're going to have their chance to repent of the way they did. They're going to be give, called to give account for every evil thing they ever did. But if they repent, they're going to find that the blood of Christ has already paid the penalty in their stead. They will be given a little time to see if they mean it, if they say they want to live the way of the law of God, the way of outflowing love. They'll have to prove it by their performance. Now we come to Hebrews 9 and verse 27. Hebrews 9:27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, after this the judgment. Yes, I read that once before. Now, we are called now. Those of us called now, you'll read in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, have been dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, we have been dying every day we live. We've only had a physical existence up to this time. But now we're going to have a chance to have the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God will open our minds to understand the Word of God and the way to live according to God's way of outflowing love, and the Spirit of God will be the love of God in our hearts to fulfill that law. The Spirit of God will be the power of God to help us to overcome Satan and to live that way. And the Spirit of God will impart to us divine God life. And we will rule with Christ as God beings. But the thing I want to point out is this. The church is called first, now. And we start a new life. It's beginning just as you were born, you started a physical life. And we start a new spiritual life from the time the Holy Spirit comes into us. The Holy Spirit in us opens our mind to understand the spiritual truths in the Bible. The world cannot understand. God is only calling a few now. A few that are predestinated. As Christ said, no man could come to him except God the Father draws him. And God is only drawing a few. Judgment has not come to the world. The chance of the world to understand these things has not come. And God's Spirit cannot be poured out on the world as a whole at this time. but only on those that are called in the church. Brethren, I wonder if you realize what a precious thing it is that we, of all the people in the world, have been called out from the world. Now, the word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, and it means a group, but it also means called out ones, called out from the world. To be separate in this way, not to be separate to wear a funny kind of hat or garment, not to be separate in physical things, but to be separate in understanding the spiritual truth of God, in understanding the way of life of God, outflowing love toward others. And we have to express that, and we have to grow. We have to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And just as the, I explained to you how we grew in our mother's womb before we were born, so now in the spiritual reproduction, 
We have to grow in spiritual truth, and the church is the mother that feeds us, and we have to grow spiritually day by day. Now, in the world they feel that if, the Christianity feels, that if you just accept Christ, focus, focus, you'll be saved. You can live any old way you want to the rest of your life, and when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Now, that's all wrong. In the first place, no one's going to heaven. In the first and the second place, just receiving Christ alone isn't enough. You have to repent of your sins. You have to begin to walk with Christ, and two can't walk together except they be agreed. You better begin to agree with Christ to walk with him. And the world is not walking in that way. But we are to walk that way. We are being fed and nourished. God has raised up this church at this time in order that we will be in that first resurrection and will become God beings in the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is the family of God, which will rule with the government of God, and when Christ comes, he will restore the government of God on the earth that Lucifer took away. The government of God has not been operative on earth since Lucifer rebelled. The government of God is operative on earth and administered only in one place, and that's in this church. And that is government in the church. And it comes from God the Father. And from God the Father it comes through Christ. And from Christ it comes from the apostle that he himself has chosen and that he prepared and that he educated and he trained. And through him he's given you the truth and the knowledge. And then there are others under me to help you and to feed you and to bring you on to a spiritual growth and a spiritual maturity and developing the very character of the living God. That is the purpose of our lives. And then we will have the responsibility of helping to save the whole world at the time of Christ coming, and we're coming closer to that all the time. Now, I don't have time to go into prophecy and things like that, but we're getting very close to the time of the end of this present time and this present age. We're coming very close to the time when God is going to intervene in the world affairs of this world and when he's going to take over. And Christ will come and the devil will be put away and then we shall reign. And without any Satan here to deceive them, the world is going to learn the truth of God. Now, there's so much more of this, so many little details. I haven't time to fill all of them in. Your local ministers will have to do that from time to time and from Sabbath to Sabbath. You will have to do it in your study. We'll try to get it to you in our various publications. And by the way, brethren, do you know that we have more publications than any church on earth, I believe. As far as I know, we do. There is the plain truth of the circulation, over two million, and reaching the world, and also for our own brethren. Then we have the Good News, a magazine, reaching our brethren, and also some co-workers and a few that are interested besides. Then we have the Worldwide News, which reaches only our own brethren, and gives us news of church activities, News of various people in the church and people that you've met at the Feast of Tabernacles and things like that, and also news every two weeks or so of how the work is going on and what is happening in this work that we have to do and in the church. Then there's the Pastor General's report that goes out every week to your minister, and there's much in that that they can take and, and, and give to you on the Sabbath sermons. Then we have for the children, we have the uh, 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 Youth 81, a magazine for youth, primarily from those from, say, about age 12 on up to and through 18. And uh, uh, 
Of course, we have Ambassador College, and we're opening Big Sandy again as a junior college this autumn, so we'll have the two college campuses. We have so many other activities that other churches do not have, like the Feast of Tabernacles and these special services and meetings. Then we have books and pamphlets and, 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 and many booklets on various subjects to feed you on the truths of God. But we must grow spiritually. It, just having accepted Christ is only the start. It's only the beginning. If you don't go on from there, you will die spiritually, and you'll just die, period. And someday you will be as though you had not been. You will be ashes under the soles of the feet of those that do grow. If you don't continue to develop and grow in spiritual character, day by day, week by week, year by year. That's what I wanted you to know, and I wanted to give you this message. How you get the truth, how you came to be here, it comes from God, it comes through Christ. Christ has imparted it to his apostles. I don't know of any apostle from the time of the original apostles until today. And where, where Christ himself, Christ taught me by this word, but he taught me in a way that I had to rid my mind and sweep the clean of every religious belief and doctrine and thought that I ever had and get it out of the Bible, pure and simple. And that's what I'm passing on to you. Brethren, I hope you realize how we are organized. There have been times when every man went his own way, the way that seemed right in his own eyes. One man this way, another man that way, another man this way, everyone going off his own way. Paul teaches us we must all speak the same thing. That thing comes from God the Father. It comes through Christ. It comes through the Apostle. And through the Apostle, it comes down through your other ministers and through our literature and our, our, our magazines and our uh, ways of printing that we have today to you, so that you get God's truth pure and simple. No other church on earth has it. No other church has ever had it for 1,900 years and more. I want you to realize how wonderful it is, how blessed we really are. Well, it's been a blessing for me to be here. I haven't seen you, I haven't been here with you for 11 years. I don't know whether it'll be another 11, and I don't know that I'll still be here 11 years from now, and I hope that Christ will be here before that time. I don't know. I don't know when he'll be here. I know he can't be here within three and a half or four years. It's going to be longer than that. And beyond that, we don't know. We know we're getting close to the time. That's all we know. And we know that we better be prepared to rise with those that will be raised from the dead, to rise and meet him as he's coming, coming in clouds. And his feet are going to stand that same day on the Mount of Olives. And I hope we'll all be there with him. So if I don't see you again until then, I'll see you then, brethren. And I hope we will, and I hope you'll realize the real seriousness of everything that I've said to you today and how serious it is. Now, we've had some trouble in the church here within the last year. That is, trouble had been brewing for a long time, but within the last year, this church has been put back on the track. And I hope we're back on the track where we belong, and I hope you realize where the truth comes from, how God channels it on down to you, how you get it. And it's in your word, the Bible. If you see something you disagree with, go to your pastor with it. If he sees something, he must go to uh, those that are high up above him, or he can come to me about it. If I'm wrong anywhere, I want to be set right. You better believe it, that I don't want to be wrong. And you better not want to be wrong either. We want to have the truth and be right and know what's right. So, with that, I'm going to say goodbye. We'll be on our way now over to New Zealand and see the brethren over there. I believe, I'm not sure I understood it correct, I believe that 
uh, one or two other of our churches and groups that tuned in and have been hearing this with you. I'm not sure. If so, uh, did them God speak the same as you? Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.